my name is Emily Williams. I'm a current researcher in geography and incoming grad student, very much in love with Santa Barbara. It's a wonderful place. And uh, I am one of the coordinators for this teach-in. Really, really excited to have you all out here. I think it's gonna be a fantastic few days. As a reminder, this teach-in, we have it uh, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Uh, really exciting things, and if you go to our website at santabarbarateachins.org, you can see the full lineup for everything going on. So, I wanted to lay the, land, or lay the landscape a little bit of why we're here today, and then pass it off to our amazing first speaker um, to really kick this thing off. But this teaching is one of many happen, happening across the country. There have been a few that have been before, there's some happening this week, some happening later on. And it's really a response to this understanding that the system that we live in today, our political and economic, social, ecological systems are broken. And our system really impacts us negatively and some of us more than others, some of us very much disproportionately based on our backgrounds. Everyone has a stake in the system. I think it's very easy to kind of distance yourself from this place that we're living in, but recognizing that it's a system that burdens us with $40,000 worth of student debt a year, or it's a system that is destroying our environment, that is polluting our communities, creating superstorms that destroy people's livelihoods, incarcerating our friends and children, and really making our lives fairly difficult to live. The system is also what keeps telling us what is acceptable and what is doable within the confines of our society. It's the thing that keeps telling you, well, you know, that's just the way it is. And life isn't fair, so we just have to move forward and accept that that's the life that we have. But the system also needs for us to believe one very key thing. It needs for us to believe that this is it. This is all we've got. It needs you to believe that imagining another system is buying into a fairy tale. But if the system was created by people, then it can also be dismantled by people and replaced by people. If the system is broken, then that means it's probably time to replace it and think about what comes next. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker, Garl Perovitz, very, very wonderful imaginary thinker. Gar is a co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, who is uh, the group that's really kicked this thing off, the Next System Project, and he is co-chair of the Next System Project. A noted historian, political economist, activist, writer, and government official, he has occupied roles as the Lionel R. Bowman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland, is a former King's, a fellow of King's College and Cambridge University, um, with the Harvard's Institute of Politics, the Institute for Policy Studies, and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institute. So he's got a lot of exciting stuff to share with us, so let's transfer it over to him and welcome Garl Perovitz. Thank you, thank you, Emily, and thank you all for being here. Um, as Emily has suggested, I, many years ago, it seems, was an insider in the establishment. I ran House and Senate staffs, uh, one for Gaylord Nelson, some of you know the founder of Earth Day, I was his legislative director. Uh, I did policy planning in the State Department, and I was involved at Harvard and at Cambridge University teaching courses in, and the University of Maryland. And throughout that time, Slowly it began to dawn on me and many, many other people that the kinds of politics we were doing, at that time particularly in the environmental movement, was for a while had begun to alter trend. And this is a key element in the system question. Whether or not what you do politically, what you do as an activist, what you do as a scholar, actually improves a trend. Or is it a gesture? And a systemic crisis is one in which the trends keep getting worse, no matter what you do, following the traditional strategies. That's how you define a systemic crisis. And I'm going to give you a bit more on that, but since there are different folks here with different experience, I want to give a broader perspective on some of that. What we're talking about is the end of capitalism, possibly. That's a system at a time when socialism itself has shown no promise of being a viable system. So you may, we may live at a time when neither of the great historic systems, neither one is viable. 
And the way you tell that is if the trends keep getting worse, no matter what you do, and then the question becomes, if we have a systemic crisis, something so deep in the system that the trends get worse no matter what, is it possible to change a system? Now, most people don't think you can. On the other hand, slowly we're beginning to see signs that people are saying it may be possible to begin to think about changing something so great as the entire American political economic system and other systems around the world. So let that sit there like a brick in your lap and kind of look at it. Is, is that crazy or is that a possibility? Might it be possible? I suggest it is not only possible but likely that we all live at a moment when we are at the beginning phases of a transformative era in American history in which the existing system is decaying before your eyes and the preliminary, I'm going to use a technical term, the prehistory, the preliminary period leading up to transformation has already begun. Now, what do I mean by that? One way to talk about it is in the period before there was an environmental movement, and there was no environmental movement at one point in time. Anyone who said you could create a movement to begin taking on major environmental issues was regarded as off the charts, impossible. And then slowly in the prehistory of the development of that movement, people began to take action, began to change views, began to create politics, and began to take on the long trends. Those of you who know about the civil rights movement, a hundred years into the, after the Civil War, very little change. If you had said you could take on segregation in the South, you would have been regarded as crazy. And yet somehow, step by step, that system was changed. My great heroes, and I give this to you as a way to think about possibilities, are the civil rights workers in states like Mississippi in the 1930s and 1940s. 20 years before what we call the civil rights movement exploded, laying groundwork for something that became a transformation. Historical change at every level is like that. So what you begin to see is signs of decay in the system, and then the preliminary foundation periods that lay down bits and pieces of ideas, of projects, of different ways of thinking about it, as a way to lay groundwork for transformation. So let me give you a few bits and pieces of what I think are signs of the emerging systemic crisis. And one of them is we're finding people, you would find unexpected people who are signing statements saying, we face a systemic crisis, not simply a political crisis. The whole system needs to be changed. Very strange thought. Those of you who get the New York Review of Book by Book, this week just happens to have a long statement saying that, but the next system project, but it's signed by th presidents of the American Political Science Association, three presidents of the American Sociological Association, a president of the Academy of Management, many other people, Robert Reich on the one hand, Noam Chomsky on the other, feminist leaders, environmental leaders, saying bluntly, it's time to do what we're doing here today all around the country, open up the question of the entire system, knowing that if there is a way forward, it will take much longer and the time will be much more difficult, but that is the crisis we face. There's other evidence like that, but that itself is a, sign, a signal for people who watch closely of a beginning awareness that something different is happening. Another way to look at it is, in the last election, who would have, in this election, who would have predicted large, large numbers of Americans, I certainly wouldn't have, self-identifying as socialists and voting for socialism, for a socialist candidate who describes himself as a socialist. Socialist terminology is a different system. Now, Bernie Sanders is a very moderate socialist or a kind of a left-wing liberal in some ways, but people in Iowa and I noticed one of these wonderful interviews in the New York Times, people in Iowa saying, 
Well, I'm voting for, for Bernie, he's a socialist, and I'm a socialist too, which is very unusual coming from Wisconsin to think that folks in Iowa would self-identify that way. What's important about those kinds of things to notice is shifting consciousness of what is acceptable to think about. That was unacceptable two years ago. The number of young people who self-identify when asked as socialists is closing in on 50% in most, most polls, some a little less, some a little more. So that there's an openness to talking about something much larger, much broader than what you've seen. There are other indicators, obviously, income distribution. The top 1%, the top, the top 400 people, that's about as many people as I think can get in this room. The top, this is a number that I always find astounding. The top 400 people in the United States have more wealth now than the bottom 180 million people taken together. The top 1% has increased its share, doubled, it, taken the share that it had, doubled it, gone up and taken down the bottom 80%. The numbers are in almost every category you can find statistic after statistic. I'm, re I'm reluctant to give you lots of numbers on this because there's so many of them. There have been a very little change in middle class wages, almost entirely flat. Virtually all of the gains have gone to the very top percent, one percent, and the one tenth of one percent. That's another signal of what's happening. Climate change is certainly another one, where the trends are not improving, and we do not have the capacity in the existing system to alter trend. So when you begin to see these kinds of data beginning to emerge, something deeper is wrong. I do want to give you some statistics that people don't commonly hear. The statistics on income and wealth have been said many, many times. But here's, your country, here's what's happening to the United States today. These are UN data. The United States health outcomes, life expectancy in the United States among the advanced industrial nations, 21 out of 21 at the bottom of the list. Mental health care, 20 out of 21, bottom of the list. Infant mortality, 21 out of 21, bottom of the list. Maternal mortality, 21 out of 21, bottom of the list. Obesity, 18th out of 18, bottom of the list. Social outcomes, income inequality, 21 out of 21, bottom of the list. Poverty, 21 out of 21, bottom of the list. Child poverty, 20 out of 21, near the bottom of the list. Gender wage gap, 19 out of 21. Gender inequality, 21 out of 21, bottom of the list. Gender in politics, 20 out of 21, near the bottom. Public social spending, 18 out of 21. Homicide rate, 21 out of 21. Voter turnout, 16th out of 21. Maternity leave, 21 out of 21. This is our country now. These are the systemic outcomes of our system. Annual leave, 20 out of 20. Educational outcomes, math scores, 20 out of 21. Science scores, 15 out of 21. Reading scores, 14 out of 21. Environmental outcomes, 20 out of 21. Carbon emissions per capita, 21 out of 21. Military spending, 21 out of 21. Those are comparative data of what the system is actually producing as compared with other advanced systems. What it tells you is it, that there is some blockage in the nature of the system. Something is going wrong. Income distribution, wealth, carbon, you name it, we are not getting positive gains. How do you begin to break that down once you begin to sense possibly that we face a deeper crisis than what would happen if you elect the next progressive or the next conservative that might alter those long, long trends and those long statistical outcomes. How do you break it down? One of the key factors that has changed, and this is one that most people are beginning to sense has greater implications than we've often seen, has to do with the radical, radical decline of organized labor in the United States. And let me put that in systemic terms. Most of the advanced industrial and post-industrial countries, Britain, France, Germany, the United States, have been organized as what's called social democracies. These are capitalist systems organized by capitalist structures and capitalist corporations. And there has been an attempt, we call it liberalism in this country, what I come out of in working in the House and Senate, that is an attempt to regulate for environmental issues, regulate for wages, 
increase welfare programs, increase child care programs, and use politics to force the system to do what it wouldn't do normally. It's a very simple model. The system generates inequality, and a countervailing force, politics, with institutional power, labor unions primarily as the institutional muscle in politics, balanced out these systems. What's happened in the United States is that worked for a while. It's no longer available. Labor unions at their peak in the United States were 33.4% of the labor force, just a little over a third. They are now down to 11% of the labor force organized. In the private sector, 6% and they are declining. The famous economist John Gal Kenneth Galbraith called it countervailing power. The countervailing power that managed the system up till now is decaying before your eyes. It's not available to elect or produce power in opposition to corporate power. And it would get worse and worse and worse as politics do what, what happened in Wisconsin to systematically attack labor. So, you can take that and you can criticize that or you can evaluate it or you can like it or dislike it. That's not the point. The point is to understand is one of the functional mechanisms, the most important functional mechanism that kept this system in balance and produced trends that were more positive for a long period is simply deca decaying before your eyes. And with it, some of the outcome trends in environment and healthcare and poverty and so in unemployment. You're seeing that decay. Another way to think about it, not simply that the countervailing power of the existing system is decaying, another way to think about it is now a good deal of historical work has been done on the period of the New Deal, that's the early 1930s, until the 1960s, the middle third of the 20th century. And people are, that's the period of the great New Deal programs and social security and welfare and labor law and it's the period that created the modern political economy we live in. People, historians are now beginning to see that as an aberrational period. It used to be thought of as a model and trend that it would continue. Labor Secretary Robert Reich sometimes writes about it that there's a cycle of history. We just go up, we go, it goes upward, but there'll be liberals, conservative, but the trend is up. The new interpretation is that that was a very unusual moment in American history, not the trend. And what happened is the Great Depression, a Republican happened to, happened to be President Hoover. The, the Great Depression occurred and the Democrats capitalized on it enormously because he was in office when the Depression, he didn't create the Depression, but he was in office, he passed a lot of legislation. World War II consolidated that and helped build the labor movement. And then all of the legislation, the social legislation, the civil rights legislation in the post-war 1950s and 60s was passed, built on that structure that in some ways was odd and unusual and aberrant, but that the system beneath it continued. So many historians now believe that it wasn't a great trend, but in fact that moment is passing and we're going back to where we were in the 1920s in a trend, the, the basic status quo of the trend. The labor movement was 11% in 1929, it is now 11% again, and the power relationships are decaying. That's another way of saying that there's an underlying systemic problem in American capitalism, and in most capitalisms that produce inequality, un unemployment, ecological issues, unless balanced, unless countervailed, unless reformed and regulated. An even broader way of looking at that is now being developed by other historians who also see us entering a systemic crisis based on developments for the whole century. And it goes this way, that the, the political economy at the beginning of the 20th century was a corporate dominated economy. What changed radically was World War I. And World War I in, in the later part of the 19, just before the 1920s, brought together a consolidation of public policies that helped regulate corporations helped build parts of the labor movement and built the preliminary basis of the modern state that we know about. And then it was further exa exaggerated and exacerbated by the Depression and World War II in the tw in second part of the century. First quarter, World War I, second quarter, something aberrant, a Great Depression and a war. 
And the third quarter of the century, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the military spending of the Cold War era bucked up the whole system for the third quarter of the century. And that now, in this interpretation, the reason the systemic problem is recurring, it was always there except for aberrant war and other developments in three quarters of the century. And now war, oddly enough, is becoming less and less functional. By functional, I mean its capacity to stabilize the system economically is weakening. Wars have a way of boosting the economy. Everybody goes to work when there's a war, and there's a lot of money around. I had, a, I had an elderly aunt in Wisconsin who lived through the Depression. She said, when World War II came along, you know, there wasn't any money around, and all of a sudden everybody had money because government spending worked. Military spending, damaging and dangerous as wars are, in fact is declining. It's gone from 14% in the 50s down to roughly 10% in the 60s, 8%, and it's now in the 3 to 4% range. What that means is that the economy that has decays and recessions and unemployment and difficulties with labor markets, it no longer has that boost from military spending. Put it another way, some people would put it this way, we're running out of war. It's an odd way of formulating it as a way to bail out some of the underlying difficulties of the economic system. And so what you see, even with the war spending we have, it's in the three to 4% range of the gross, gross domestic product. Those who are you are economists, Keynesian economists, this is a very small stimulus for the economy that used to have 14% during the Korean War. So the capacity of military spending to bail out some of the underlying economic problems is no longer with us. So that's another reason that people are beginning to say the deeper problems of the system, unemployment, instability, long-term political and economic decay are returning to norm and that the norm is not a good norm. It's a norm of growing pain, growing ecological destruction, growing discrimination, and that that underlying quality is coming to the surface. And with it, something else, attitudinal change. People beginning to be angry at what's going on. Large numbers of people, young people particularly, black people, white people, elderly, saying more and more in polls what they said in the election with Bernie that something profound is going wrong here, that it's no longer, if we can just elect another progressive or another liberal or another conservative, we will solve our problems. A sense that politics as we know it, which is part and parcel of the system, no longer has the capacity to solve problems, decay, unemployment, college. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, there was something close to free tuition. I paid $90 a, month, $90 a semester tuition. It was almost entirely paid by taxpayers. That's another way of talking about the systemic crisis, putting educational costs on you rather than on the public. Part of the system, systemic crisis, the inability to do the sorts of things that a normal advanced system does regularly in Europe. But we no longer have that capacity. We no longer have the reform capacities. So I could give you, obviously, much more painting this picture of, of a system in decay, but what I'd like to suggest to you is a particular oddity of the emerging structure we're seeing. This is a system that apparently is not going to collapse. Why is that? Because there's enough government spending under the economy, so we're not likely to see a Marxist collapse. In 1929, the government was 11% of the economy. It's now up in the 32% range. We may see stagnation and decay, but not likely a big sudden collapse. On the other hand, it doesn't succeed. It doesn't solve the problems. The trends go south. There's more and more unemployment. There's disillusionment. There's growing sense of frustration, but no great crisis. A period of stalemate politically, stagnation, and decay is the emergent context of a systemic crisis that we're witnessing. And along with it, the attitudes that come along with that. Disillusionment. People voting for Trump on the one hand, people voting for Bernie on the other hand, growing sense that something's wrong, and it doesn't collapse, it decays. And there's growing, we have not yet seen major violence. We probably will as the, as the anger grows in this context. But it's also producing 
And this is the most interesting thing about the current era. It's producing people who are beginning to say something profound, something truly fundamental is wrong here, something systemic. And moreover, it would be possible, great movements have started in the past, we know that from the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the environmental movement, even the conservative movement, which in the 1940s was minuscule and people built it up over 30 or 40 years to the scale when it could take on and, and produce the presidency of the United States. People are beginning to say, it is not beyond human capacities. We know this historically. It's not beyond the power of people to say, something's wrong here. How do we begin to conceptualize it? What would a different political economic system actually look like that produced equality liberty, ecological sustainability, real democracy, a reduction in wars and military ventures. What would a system that generated outcomes like that, what would it look like? How would you describe it? How would you build it? Take that word seriously. You are going to live into this era. You're already in it. How would you build it? Obviously, one level is raising consciousness and politics and thinking about and learning about and beginning to describe the situation in new terminology, beginning to get beyond slogans and beginning simply beyond politics and elections. A second thing, and this is part of the Next System Project and the 10,000 people who signed the statement running from all the names I mentioned earlier and the presidents. We just got one more president of the American, Political, uh, American Sociological Association signed this morning saying it's time to begin thinking through and designing, think of that, designing a next system. The last time we did that was the Constitutional Convention, when people actually said, think about these guys, and they were all guys, they said, we are going to design a system. And they did, you're living in what's left of it. But they built, they self-consciously said, we could apply human intelligence to the question of where do we want to go over the next 30 or 40 years? What would actually produce equality? How would you put it together to achieve liberty? How would you build a system that was not warlike? How do you get beyond slogans and rhetoric and all naive approaches? What would it look like? People are beginning to ask that question theoretically. If you go to the nextsystem.org, the website, you'll see, I think we've found 26 different models that academics have produced projecting a big dialogue, just like the per period of the Confederate the, the debates over the Constitution. Some of them begin with, for instance, instead of corporations owning wealth, why can't workers own the wealth? Owning wealth is a big part of the power structure. Why can't that be democratized? And some people have begun to develop very, very coherent and intelligent theories of how to do that. Other people are starting at the environmental end and looking at environmental regions and regional, regional approaches that start with environmental values and environmental culture and build up to models of an alternative system, theorizing about that. Other people begin at traditional, traditional socialist level, that is nationalization is part of the puzzle. Why? Because you, the big corporations, one, are impossible to control, and two, they have to grow. I want to stress that for you environmentalists in this room. One of the problems, and we ran into this, that when I was working in the Senate on these issues, businesses that have to go to Wall Street, private corporations that have to go to Wall Street for financing, and all of the big ones do, cannot not grow. They will not get investment, and they will go out of business unless they show increasing profits regularly year after year. That means they must not only grow, but they must find ways to increase profits. Often by destroying the environment, because it's cheaper to do that. Often by growing and using up resources, because they must do that or they will die, the stock market will reject them. So some people are looking at public enterprise, at least does not have that quality. It is not driven by stock market business relationships and could be part of the system design. One of the things to know about that around the world, there are many, many, many examples of, of efficient public enterprise that people are looking at. Go ride in the French railroads, for instance, or, or the Japanese railroads, which are very, very efficient, socialized public enterprises. So people are beginning to say that could be a part of the puzzle. Other people are starting purely at culture. 
That is, how do people relate to each other in a community? How do we get better male, female, children relationships? How do we get a sense of community? How do we work, work from culture and come back to what would be the economic structures that would support and sustain and nurture a better culture of equality and better relationships? So this is another branch of what's happening in the next system debate. All of these areas, there are people, activists as well as scholars, beginning to generate the preliminary, and I, want, I wouldn't go further than this, we're beginning to get the first stages, the preliminary stages of serious theory and ideas. If you want, I sometimes say you want to play this game, the, the chips are decades of your life. To change a, something like a political economic system, you are talking basically about opening up a long historical perspective. You're talking about those folks in Mississippi who started out and laid the groundwork 10, 20, 30 years on to build the ideas, first the ideas and the culture, and then the experiments, and then the theory, and then the movements that begin to take on power and scale as they go forward. So that's the kind of thing we're seeing. If you go to these various websites, you'll begin to see huge numbers of people doing this that the press isn't covering. For instance, if one of the key ingredients in changing the system is changing who owns all the productive wealth rather than the top one or one-tenth percent and the large corporations. And if one element is worker cooperatives and worker-owned companies, there are sophisticated experiments going on all over the country now in changing who owns wealth in, in, by workers and communities. In Cleveland, for instance, there's a model of worker-owned companies, large scale, linked together with a community corporation so the profits benefit the community and purchasing power of hospitals and universities, which buy $3 billion in goods and services a year in that particular town, same as in any big city, buying from these worker cooperatives that are trying to build the community and the workers. That's going on right now, and they're environmentally sound, very advanced environmentally. There are experiments going on in Rochester. Another piece of the puzzle, this is happening now with very little press coverage. Two cities in the United States are now setting up or beginning to set up public banks, Philadelphia and Santa Fe. Probably all of you know that the very, very conservative state of North Dakota, North Dakota has a state bank 100 years old, Socialist Bank, which is supported by the farmers and the small businessmen. Another piece of the puzzle, maybe. People are looking at regional structures. And this is one area I'd suggest you really, those of you who begin to think about, really think about living into an era where changing the system may be on the horizon, one of the really big problems in the United States that most people have been staying away from since the 1930s is as follows. And I'll, I'll throw the question to you. Tell me how we can have participatory democracy, you guys think about it, in a continental system 3,000 miles across of 325 million people. What does participatory democracy mean in so huge a system? So, what is it, if, it, if this system is too large, what do you do about it? One of the other issues that's come back to be discussed is regions rather than continents need to be part of the restructuring of democracy. So regional structures, the only region that you know about that's reasonable in terms of size is the state of California itself, which is the seventh or eighth largest economy and could be either a nation or a participating region in a nation. So there's a lot of discussion about regions. If most, if most states are too small, and if the continent is too big to manage democratically, the intermediate unit is called a region. So people are beginning to think about long-term structural redesign along those dimensions as well. So I think what I want to suggest to you is that what we're beginning to see, and, and we will see how this goes forward, is decay in the existing system and the traditional models are no longer available to manage it. Particularly, but if we had time, we could go to many other facets, the collapse of the labor movement as a way to constrain and manage and reform the model. And a system that doesn't collapse. Opening up a huge debate, opening up political movements, black light matters, feminist movements, new gender movements, environmental movements, climate change movements, all beginning to respond because the answers aren't forthcoming from the system and driving deeper and deeper into the period when three questions are really on the table and they are the questions for the rest of this conference. How do you really analyze a systemic crisis? Will it flip over into violence and fascism?
Is there a reform path? Is it a revolutionary path? The last time we've seen that in the United States was the American Revolution. Is that what we're looking at? Is there something, here's another term of art. Is there something that might be called evolutionary reconstruction? Evolutionary reconstruction. Neither reform, which is what American liberalism tried to accept the capitalist system and reform it around the edges, nor revolution, but the buildup in an evolutionary way of new and more institutions like the ones I've described, worker ownership, efforts in culture, efforts in cities. The state of Bo in Boulder, they took over the municipal enterprise utility in order to deal with climate change. Voters took it on in two referendum. A process of changing the underlying economic structure that is evolutionary but begins to point towards a far more radical solution, radical in the sense that it's new in its ideas, in an evolutionary reconstructive way. So thinking secondly about different ways and different pathways to the future is part and parcel of it. And the third piece, and it always ends up here, the third piece is existential. We live in this system, and most of you are, will live into it directly. So it becomes a question not only of ideas, not only of historic change, not only of new models in theory, and a great deal of theory, theorizing, and in practice, and in experiments, and in politics, as in what's happened in Boulder, and what's happening in Cleveland, what's happening in cities like Santa Fe and Philadelphia, where people are actually experimenting with new models, They're doing land trusts as well. There's a whole lot of more material about what's really happening on the ground at the same time the theory is developing. But in the end, it always ends up as an existential issue. What do I mean by that? That means nothing happens unless people individually, and I'm talking, by the way, to the person sitting in your chair and mine, whether people actually, as in the civil rights movement and in the feminist movement and in the anti-war and the environmental, actually look themselves in the mirror in the morning and saying, that's my problem, too. Not simply a historic problem, not simply an academic problem, not simply a political problem, not simply a reconstruction problem, but a problem of whether or not I personally am willing <clears throat> to take responsibility for, bu <clears throat> for building parts of the solution. It comes down in, that, in the end to trying out, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to face the, the matter directly <clears throat> and personally, and sorry, this needs some water, but we don't have it. Um, try, whether or not we personally and directly begin to take on the issues that I'm describing. And they can be done anywhere. Experiments can be done in any community. The university is a particular, oh, thank you very much. The university is a particularly interesting place to do the theorizing, but also we're finding, and this is true in the Cleveland model, that the university has major resources. It can help out the development of some of these experiments. And I want to say they are experiments. What, this has, what the period I would suggest we're in is the prehistory, as I said earlier not yet the history of the possible transformative period. And in these kinds of situations, as always in prehistory or history, there is no certainty. So the final demand, and it's very personal demand, is to understand the failings of the system, very difficult, and also to say, not knowing for certain Think of those people in Mississippi in the 1930s who would be hung from a tree for trying something new, not knowing personally that you could actually succeed. So beginning to grasp the issue, joining movements, and trying to force back the sense of what is happening to a deeper and deeper depth, and at the same time asking personally how do we actually advance our knowledge, advance our experiments, advance our theory, and broaden our horizons to the depth of the actual problem we face, namely, how do we build the next system? Thank you very much.